All right, we are back for another episode of With the Facts Podcast. I'm Marielle, uh, the creator and one of the hosts, because we got some other people that have joined the squad. Um, but I'm really grateful to have Malik Blade with me today. We're going to be talking about Black men and mental health. Um, this is a conversation that I think we need to have um, and and really not just have it, but be intentional in our action of giving people access to <laughs> mental health um, and, and being able to have access to therapy. So I'm really excited to have you on, Malik. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Of course, of course. So first, for people who have not heard of you or may not be familiar with you and your work, just give us a little bit a bit about your background and who you are. Yeah. So my name is Malik Blade. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. I'm the CEO of the Whole Brother Mission. Uh, the Whole Brother Mission is a nonprofit uh, seeking to equip to seeking to equip men to be whole in every area of life. We do that through focusing on our three core areas: the head, the heart, and the hands. The head is mental health. The heart is emotional maturity, and the hands represent professional advancement. We've become most known for providing assisted access to mental health care services for Black men nationwide. So pretty much, if you're in any of the United States, you can reach out to us. Uh, to be connected with a culturally competent therapist. And if there is a financial barrier there, we can assist with finances for select cases. And uh, in addition to that, we want to normalize this conversation around mental health and emotional maturity, but some people are skeptical about therapy. So we wanted to be able to put a resource in the hands of people as well. So May, 2020, we released uh, our first resource authored by me with contributions from many of our partner counselors called Whole Brother Debunk in the Mist to Break the Black Family. Uh, and that is uh, right behind me. Uh, for those that are interested, it's available on our, our site, wholebrothermission.com, but also pretty much online wherever books are sold, Amazon, as well as other places. Awesome. So you touched on something that actually was literally my first question. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> with Black men in particular have a very strong hesitancy when it comes to um, most times medically anything. Um, we know it's hard to get Black men to go to the doctor, right? Um, to get things uh, examined early, to maybe be caught early. You know, we recently lost chat with Bozeman to, um, mm -hmm. to um, cancer. And so just things of that nature. Um, but I especially sometimes see this hesitancy when it comes to emotional health. Um, and um, and I think a lot of that is just kind of what's been stigmatized within the black community itself. And just from historical perspectives um, and how therapy can be seen um, in regards, not just black men, but just the black community as a whole um, in that way sure. and how it can have some negative connotations to it. Uh, and so in the work that you're doing and in kind of just in your opinion, you know, what are some things that we, as a community can do to kind of destigmatize um, therapy um, and to to really show its benefits, really. Um, what and what are, what are you seeing and kind of what's your opinion around that? Right. So there's so many answers to that question, but one I would point to is one of the myths addressed in the book. I forget what what chapter it is, but there's a, a, a chapter about a myth and that myth is uh, distractions as solutions or distractions are solutions. And it's this idea that many of us as men face that uh, if I can just take my attention off of it, then it's resolved. Uh, so that kind of speaks to this idea that you mentioned of, of not wanting to go to the doctor out of sight, out of mind. And many of us have vices or habits that we use to take our attention off of the issue itself but it's not actually resolving it. It's just distracting us for a period of time. So I do think that has to kind of be debunked and we have to establish a more healthy approach. And of course that applies to mental health and emotional issues as well, rather than suppressing it, which many do by alcohol, drugs, or, or even sex, uh, dealing with whatever the issue is directly and being willing to identify there's an issue and seeking help to, to resolve it. And I think, um, in a general sense, that's just not normal for us, unfortunately. And there are a lot of pieces to that. I do think others contribute to creating a culture where black men feel like I can't be vulnerable or express that there's an issue. But I do think if by and large, we can get to a point 
where we adopt the approach of dealing with things head on when it comes to personal issues that be helpful. And I'll just say one more thing. It is an interesting thing because in every other aspect of life, we encourage men to deal with things head on. Uh, I mentioned in the book, if someone was breaking into a man's house, the expectation for himself and from others would be for him to run to the to the door or to wherever the intruder is to defend his family, uh, to defend it, uh, to to respond head on. So in that area of life, we believe in being assertive and direct uh, and directly aggressive, not passive. But for some reason, when it comes to emotions and things like that, uh, and personal issues, we accept passivity. So I do think if we could spin that on his head, we could see better results. Yeah, it, just from personal dealing with other black men that are in my life. And, you know, I'm usually pretty open about how much therapy has helped me and, you know, mm -hmm. things of that nature. But a lot of the feedback that I get typically is somehow it is seen as and unmasculine a mass it's like it's not masculine for you to go into therapy um somehow mm -hmm. it's gotten tied to manhood in a, in a way like somehow that makes you less of a man because you yeah. are admitting that something emotionally is off and that you really mm -hmm. want to try to deal with that and it's so admitting that you actually have emotions and that's the exactly, issue. exactly. Pretend that we don't. i mean because <laughs> even watching how a lot of boys have been raised if they cried when something hurt them it's like stop all that crying and, you, and it's like what are we teaching them in that moment that when something hurts you don't address it <laughs> like mm -hmm. like right. suck it up like but no i think that there is a level of vulnerability that needs to happen and it is okay for you to cry it's okay to say that this hurts me you know, it's OK to say that I was a victim regarding something. Um, and with black men right now in America, I just my heart really kind of breaks for black men because there literally feels like there's a target on your back when you walk out the door every day. Right. Um, and to see other black men on your TV screen day in, day out be murdered, be um, killed unjustly, that has to shift you in some kind of way. And so what's alarming for me is that a lot of um, Black men don't know where to put those emotions. And I'm learning that trauma that's not really dealt with can, can curd and sour into toxicity um, if you don't deal with it, right? Um, and so that's part of my concern is when trauma is not dealt with, um, and in your experience, have you seen this, when trauma has not been dealt with, do you feel like it can be generational? So like from one man passing it down to the next and to the next, because we're not leaving breathing room for them to be able to express themselves or be able to talk to someone um, about the emotional aspects of it. Have you seen that be generational? Do you think it's generational with the trauma? I'll, I'll, I'll personalize it in answering that question. So uh, my grandmother is Hattie Barber and she had four children. My mother, Gwendolyn, my aunt, Angela, uh, my uncle Gregory and my uncle Billy, who who passed uh, two years ago. Uh, so she had four children. Each of those four children have different fathers. Uh, my mother's father died early in her life, and I think she only met him once. Uh, my father's father is still alive, but they don't speak to each other. They actually kind of hate each other. Uh, my dad was uh, is a, a drug addict and was not involved in my life and produced several traumatic experiences. And I have in part dedicated myself to this work, not just for me to change uh, the next generation of my family of men and women, but also to help others change that trajectory as well so we don't keep repeating the cycles. Uh, I gave that kind of family history just to point to there's a lot, there was a lot of brokenness and it continued on down to me. Uh, and I want to be the person to change that. So I do think that, yes, 
uh, a lot of these traumas are passed down because they affect how we parent. And parenting, whether we want to accept it or not, does play a big, big part in who children go up to be as adults. Yes, they establish independence and make their own decisions, but I don't think we realize just how much even the way that we make decisions, how we connect to people, what we look at as love, what we look at as good, what we look at as bad, what we look at as acceptable is heavily informed by what we saw in our homes. Uh, so I do think trauma can be passed forth, uh, destructive behaviors, destructive mindsets, sex, toxicity, all those things can be passed on because they're normalized in the home. And it takes one, someone bringing that to your attention or you realizing that these behaviors or mindsets are toxic or destructive and being willing to change that so that the future generations can have a better future. And I personally want, want to do that in my family. Yeah. So I can identify with that just on my end with watching the black women in my family um, mm -hmm. who are very amazing, strong women. However, um, when life has been hard and hit, they were they were not giving the breathing room to lean into the pain to be able to articulate it it was just an expectation of you keep going you you are you know you just you just don't even address it just keep pushing that's that's strong we love using that word with black women <laughs> like be strong you know just and and i've seen it in so many different ways so now here i am and it's like, I see those same um, behaviors uh, and I've made the, de the the decision that has to stop <laughs> like, because mm -hmm. I can't not not address, you know, that this happened to me, that this is hurtful, that this was a trauma, mm -hmm. that this is pain, painful. Um, and to me, the strength is in me being able to say that and go deal with it, not me just moving on acting like it didn't happen um, and having the breathing room. So even with me going to therapy, there was some hesitancy, you know, even in some conversations with certain family members of, you know, well, why do you want to go do that? <laughs> you know, like, because in black communities, we feel like you don't tell house business outside the house. Like that's just, mm -hmm. that's a rule. You don't tell a stranger that. So but that's why we're in bondage because we keep it all in. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And it's just, yeah. it's a crazy cycle of, <laughs> it's like, we're all walking around here and not to just mention the trauma right. that you, like, exactly. We just all walking around bleeding, like wounded. It's the equivalency of you having a really bad wound, knowing you need to go to the hospital, but you like, nah, I'm good. And we see you're bleeding because it's man. We see the blood, like it's manifesting mm -hmm. itself. It manifests in your tweets. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In your tweets and how you treated other people and like just yep. so many different ways. And it's like, you need to go deal with that. Yeah. Um, and even in how you see yourself, like I can tell when people right. are unhealthy by how they treat themselves, like yeah. even with they, our health. Date. Yeah. Like even in our health, like, you mm -hmm. know that you need to do better, but you no, there's something there like emotional eating. Like I have totally seen that. Oh, um, and have experienced that. Let me just put that out there too. And I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't just food. This is something else that I'm not dealing with. And I'm using this yeah. as a coping mechanism, right? Right. So um, one of the things that you talked about in, um, in the opener was, you know, what you guys are doing around really trying to make mental health services more accessible. Kind of walk me through that and the ways in which you're doing that, um, across the country to just get get black men access to that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a group of partner counselors. Ninety eight percent of them are, are black uh, across the country. And so what happens is you can be anywhere within the United States. You reach out to us via whole W.H.O.L.E. Brother Mission dot com under the Get Help tab. You can fill out a form. It'll ask you a few questions. And from there, uh, you can be connected with a counselor or someone for some type of support services through a variety of means. So one way is typically you reach out, you clarify what your insurance is, and we'll look in, the, in your state to see who our partner counselors are, what insurance they take, and try to connect you with someone. 
If we don't have someone that takes your insurance, we'll do the work to try to find someone. So we're pretty much doing the heavy lifting so that all you have to do is show up for your appointment. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes people don't aren't clear. I, I would argue most Americans don't know how their medical insurance works. It's just a thing that most of us are ignorant about. Mm -hmm. So we, we have staff that can help you in understanding uh, what your insurance includes and what it doesn't include. Uh, for those that need to, you can apply for Medicaid insurance through your state and Medicaid covers mental health services. So you can see a therapist 100 percent free if you get Medicaid. Uh, but for the instances where none of that is a possibility, we do cover 100 percent of the fees for someone to see a therapist. So that's why we really have really heavy on fundraising so that we can pay the therapist uh, to take on these clients. Uh, what's unique about what we do is most similar organizations, what they do is they ask uh, maybe a list of 800 therapists to be willing to offer a few sessions for free, maybe three sessions a year for free. And then what happens is they have a list of 800, three free sessions per person. Then you have a whole bunch of sessions that you can pass out. Uh, but the issue with that is you're then taking money out of the pockets of black clinicians. So we wanted to look at it from a twofold perspective. We want to help these people, but we also want to pay these black professionals what they worked to be able to do. So we, we want to help on, on both sides. Yeah. Um, so question, is it, are you giving, sending them to black men who are therapists or it's just black people? It doesn't matter, black women, black men, just so they have. Yeah, so most of our therapists are black, but we have some that are not. You know, some people may benefit from talking to someone outside of their culture. Uh, so there's that. We do have some non-black counselors, but as far as our black counselors, they're male and female. Not all of them are men, because once again, everybody's situation is different, and you may find that it's helpful. You know, hypothetically speaking, let's say it's a guy that's trying to understand his mom issues. And he needs a motherly perspective, but his mother's relationship with him is off. So it may, in that case, it may be helpful for him to talk to a, a mother who is also a therapist, a black woman. That might be helpful for him. In another instance, it might be a guy dealing with father wounds and a man may be more fitting. So everyone's situation is unique. That's why we saw to empower both black and uh, male and female therapists. Yeah. And I do know also statistically there still is such a shortage of black men who are therapists. Um, mm -hmm. That is a need. Um, I have people in my life who are black women who prefer black men as therapists for them, just because of what you just said, because they have issues maybe with their, with father figures that were in their life, they kind of need, they wanted that person to kind of give them that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so, my hope is that we get more black men and just more black therapists period in this space. Um, I am surrounded by a lot of black therapists and um, I'm very concerned for them right now, just because the pandemic really sent their load into overdrive, <laughs> into overdrive. So yeah, they have a lot of clients to the point where it's overwhelming um, and how many people really are like, I, this is a lot. I need therapy, like who maybe are engaging with therapy for the very first time since the pandemic happened. So I'm really hoping that we get more black men, black women, but especially black men in that space because they're so needed um, and there still is a shortage, period. Um, so walk me through the book a little bit. Um, why did you write this book? Um, you know, why did you think it was necessary to have this form of a resource for people to have? And just kind of walk us through some of the major points in the book that you would like people to know about. Mm -hmm. So I would say I, I wrote it because of personal experiences in my personal life, but also in my work life. So my personal life, I've come across several male friends, specifically black men who I noticed we're dealing with some level of emotional dysfunction, uh, some level of codependency on substances, and some level of identity issues as it relates to what is appropriate for a man to do and what isn't. Um, so I, I kept observing things that I thought, well, that's, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't add up. And I, I found myself in frustrating situations where it's like uh, long-term friendships 
uh, you have a situation where a long-term friend is going through terrible circumstances, but still wants to keep that from you because they don't want to look vulnerable in front of another another male. Um, you know, so those situations kept coming up, and I'm like, well, why why are we like this? Uh, because that wasn't how I came up. Uh, I've I've had although my father had was not present. I've had a community beyond my mom, but of men that were there that I was able to depend on and be open with and be vulnerable with. So I don't have this, I guess, bravado of trying to look like a quote unquote alpha male at all times. And I found that those that have that uh, tend to be deeply insecure. It's kind of a cover up for the insecurity. So I've seen that quite a bit. And then I've also noticed in my professional life before uh, working with the whole brother mission, I worked in the university space, uh, typically at, at white colleges and universities, but there was a micro uh, cosm of black students there. Most recently was a university in Oklahoma and there were uh, a lot of black student athletes. And I was a Dean, so I had to deal with discipline. So I would have black male students in my office for some type of infraction. And as I would talk through it, I wanted to be restorative and not just focus on discipline. And as we talk through it, it would come out that, hey, this is what's going on in my house. I'm actually in college to get away from my home because home life is terrible. Um, not sure how I'm going to eat. I did that because I haven't eaten and so on and so forth. And, you know, there were several traumatic stories I heard. And the first time they shared it was in the dean's office because I made them feel comfortable enough to share those things. And why i thought that was good that they could share i hate that their first time open enough was in college so it got to a point where i was like you know i really want to address this area because i don't see it being addressed enough uh and it has to do with not just the mental health but emotional maturity um yes they did share but it was because i had the patience to work through the layers there were about three or four meetings where they kept pretending like nothing was wrong i'm good i'm good i'm good i'm like no, you're not, because <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you were good. Uh, so it's both, it's that personal piece, but also in my professional life, seeing uh, black men in what I would call somewhat of an emotional prison uh, and lacking the emotional competency to express themselves. Uh, we, we, we have our go-to phrases, you know, I'm good, uh, all is well, or either just kind of getting drunk or hot. And that's how a lot of guys cope with life. And I don't want to generalize because I don't want to feed this narrative that black men are all this way, but that does exist though. And uh, I, I want brothers to know that although it's been normalized, doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy or beneficial. We have to begin to address things that don't serve us. So the book is kind of spinning certain norms on their head and offering a better way to move through life. Yeah. Um, so you said something that I kind of want to unpack just a little bit. And you were saying sure. that when you grew up, you had a community of men. Mm -hmm. um, kind of talk to me a little bit about that um, and the things that those men in community offered you um, that gave you yeah. that kind of safe space. So for if there are men right now listening to be like, you know, I really want to help the young brothers in my community. I just don't really know how. I don't know mm -hmm. the ways in which to do that. Kind of unpack that for me just a little bit. Yeah. So it's crazy. Even you asking that question made me get a little bit emotional. Comes like, man, because I think about how I'm lucky. I really am. I think you can say blessed. I'm in a unique situation where although my dad wasn't there, I had an older brother uh, who was just amazing. And even in going to college and leaving our family and starting a new family in North Carolina, he, we still stayed in contact and he played somewhat of a father role in helping me establish identity independent of what the culture said. So I think uh, the difference maker for me was at home, I was given confidence and a foundation to know who I am. So I wasn't seeking certain things from people because I already had it at home. So my trajectory was a, a much different than most guys. In addition to that, godparents, my godfather, great guy, just amazing guy all around. He's well loved by everybody that knows him. And then there were other people in the latter part of my life that came along. Um, and they were able to be very honest with me, but I was also willing to receive it. And I think 
because of my relationship with my brother in recognizing that love from a man may be perceived as abrasive or dangerous or somebody hating on you. But because I had that with him, I was able to establish those relationships later and not feel challenged by those guys. But to recognize if, a, if another man is taking the time to give you some kind of direction, that's because he cares. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't get so caught up in how something was said. But look at the message, though. What is being communicated to you? So I was open to those things later. And so I can uh, I met, actually I referenced all of these men in the dedication at the beginning of the book. But that was my experience. And unfortunately, I found that so many other men do not have that. And their fathers may be alive and well and in the house, and they still don't have that. So that's why at the, at the beginning of the book, I address four different types of fathers. One is an, an absent father. Uh, the other is the toxic father. Uh, another is the present but distant father. And the fourth is the mother as a father. So the absent father is just the father that's not in the home at all. Uh, toxic father is a father that's present but has mindsets and behaviors that are toxic that he endorses and passes on to those within the household. Uh, but what I found is so many guys, even though my dad wasn't there, I'm much better off emotionally than some men who did have their dad in the house. They had present but distant fathers physically present, but emotionally distant. And those tend to be the ones that are really messed up because it's like he was there, yeah. but I couldn't touch him. So, you know, that ends up even being more damaging, I found. And then last, there's a whole dynamic that comes with single mothers having to play both roles. Um, and that, that plays out a certain way. So uh, I feel blessed that I was able to have an abundance of those. But so many men are in a position where their dad's not there or he is there, but he's just emotionally distant. So they're looking, they don't recognize it, but they're looking in all the wrong places to kind of feel affirmed and valued. Yeah. So for for men who are listening to this and, you know, they they know that they want to be helpful to just even the, the young men in their lives. Um, it may not or just in the community or in their lives personally. What do you think are some um what some suggestions you may could give them to kind of start building those relationships to kind of pour into these young men that are coming up. Yeah, I definitely think it requires uh, a godly level of patience <laughs> because unfortunately <laughs> within our culture, I think there's a lot of contributing factors, but there is a distrust for black men amongst black men especially after you get to a certain age where it's like, I'm not going to listen to what you got to say. You don't know nothing. And, you know, as a younger guy, we joke about bitter old heads, old black men that just are rude, just nasty people. <laughs> um, you know, and there's a, they have a story too. Uh, but I think that patience is important because if, if somebody didn't have that foundation at home, uh, they start growing up into the world, learning to function without it. So when they already get into adulthood and they might be set in their ways, it's, it's hard to kind of turn that on a dime and then be vulnerable and open and trust someone uh, without fear of that being used against you, without fear of them leaving you or whatever the case may be. So the exact thing that's needed, which is open and vulnerable spaces with men that can help lead and guide, is the exact thing that many of us are conditioned to avoid. Um, so it just requires a level of patience. They'll be in and out. Um, and I know that that can be frustrating. I've experienced that in trying to support others, but that patience is super important in, uh, in not taking it personal, uh, where there may be some resistance to what you're trying to offer. You're offering it in good faith. You don't want anything in return. But even still, there will be some resistance and even opposition there. And I've come to recognize that is them wrestling internally. So it takes patience to understand that and not take it personal and to not give up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I I'm encouraged by, you know, a lot of, you know, organizations and even fraternities of men who are, you know, trying their best to 
impact the next generation because it's needed. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm I'm concerned because a lot of them have trauma and don't even know it's trauma. Um, I always like to say sometimes we think we're a certain way, but really we're not that way. We're just, you know, manifesting what our trauma has taught us to be. And so kind of pulling off all of those layers and having a community to kind of help you plus with therapy and plus, you know, just being able to have just a good village around you, I think is really important um, for people who are listening and they are like, yo, I love what you're doing. You know, how can how can we be supportive if we want to get involved with whole brother mission? How do we do that? Um, so what are some steps that people can do to actually just get involved with what you're doing? Yeah. So one thing will be helpful is helping us build the platforms to get the messaging out. So YouTube page just started trying to be intentional with that and building that up. So whole brother mission on YouTube, following, uh, subscribing and sharing the content. There are quite a few videos already out there, but we're looking to invest in that more. Uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. It's all whole brother mission. Uh, so that that's super helpful as far as building the social platforms to get other people involved. And it doesn't doesn't cost you a thing. But in addition to that, we are a 501c3, so all donations are tax deductible. So giving on our website, wholebrothermission.com, that's super helpful, as well as it does uh, contribute toward covering the fees for men to see a therapist, but also uh, taking the book uh, on an HBCU book tour. That's been delayed several months due to COVID, so we don't know when the schools are going to open back up. But when they do, we will be taking the book on tour, say at least five to six HBCUs. Uh, and lastly, it's uh, hoodies for wholeness. So if you go to our website and check the shop, you'll see a hoodie that says positive motivating force. And hoodies for wholeness is where you purchase one hoodie and that hoodie covers the cost of uh, one therapy session for a man in need. So you can support in that way. And in addition to that, uh, if asking your employer if they do matching donations, uh, you can give what you can give, but if your employer does matching donations, you can then double your gift. So that's something to look to into as well. I love it. And as we come to a close for people who want to just kind of connect with you, um, you know, and just be able to support you <laughs> in, in, yeah. in their work, because I think sometimes when we're doing this type of work, we give so much of ourselves um, oh, yeah. that it, it really, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's like, oh, my goodness. And sometimes we're tired. We, you know, just because we're normal human beings, like it just it happens. Um, but just being able to have people that can support you, follow you. Um, what are some ways that they can do that? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Malik, M-A-L-I-E-K, Blade, B-L-A-D-E, all the same, same handle. Uh, and yeah, you know, uh, I think the best way to support is once again, helping build those social profiles so that we can get the word out and then others can support as well. I think um, we built an infrastructure internally that works as far as serving our clients as a nonprofit. Uh, and we recently turned our attention to trying to build beyond those that we're servicing. So that is really huge, helping us get the word out and sharing, sharing the content. Uh, and then lastly, I would say uh, the book as well, uh, supporting that uh, as not just for yourself, but as, as a gift uh, to others. Because for me personally, uh, what's gratifying is not just uh, the fundraising or the sales or support of merch, but it's actually seeing the practical life changes for people. Uh, generational change, as you mentioned earlier, and men feeling comfortable in their skin and not feeling the need to fit a certain stereotype. So I poured my uh, heart and mind and education and all that into the book so that it can be a resource for our people to understand black men better, the context we come from, but to improve relations between black men and women as far as our families and keeping them together. So I think uh, helping get that out so that we can see the change will be super helpful. And for those that uh, per, are on podcasts and are, are moving away from uh, printed content, the book is available as an audio book as well uh, on Audible. So just wanted to, to let you know that it's available through a variety of means, Amazon and Audible, but it's also on our site as well. Uh, and you can get a signed copy directly from our site and more of the resources will come back to us through our site rather than Amazon. 
because Amazon is stingy. Uh huh. They are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll make sure we put like all of that in the show notes. Um, people who are part of our Patreon community, we try to do a, um, a syllabus with each episode. So we'll make sure we lay all of that out as well. Um, so they have it. I feel like I'm going to do this and I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. So I make sure that I do it. I at least want to bless and give away two books. So um, we'll do a giveaway um, for the book. Cool. Um, Thank yeah. You. Thank you for taking the time out to, you know, talk about this topic. Um, thank you for the work that you are doing. Um, I hope in the midst of all of that you're doing that you're able to just take care of yourself and take a break and a breather when you need to as well. Um, because again, I know, <laughs> yeah, I know doing this work, it's a lot. And so we got to take care of ourselves too. So, but I just really um, appreciate um, the work that you're doing and appreciate you for coming onto the podcast to kind of dive a little bit deeper. Definitely. I appreciate you having me and helping get the word out. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, y'all keep it locked for more episodes. They're on the way. See y'all next time.